what makes for a great story? That is a question that I ask myself a lot. First of all, because I'm a dad. And as Tim said, I have four little girls who are constantly begging me to tell them new stories, which I run out of. And so I'm always looking for the best ones to tell and to read. Uh, second, I am a preacher. I'm a professional communicator, if you will. And as you know, stories, of course, are one of the most powerful forms of communication. So I'm often asking myself, what makes for a great story? And obviously, there are a lot of factors that make for a great story, but here's one that you may have not thought about before. Unusual coalitions. Unusual coalitions. And before I tell you what I mean by that, let me just show you. I have a few images uh, to show you, and I apologize to those of you in the back who can't see them very well. Here is a spider and a pig. Of course, spiders are nothing like pigs. Pigs are nothing like spiders. And this particular pig, Wilbur, admits that he initially is repulsed by the spider Charlotte. He says she's fierce and brutal and bloodthirsty and scheming. He is afraid to be her friend. But over time, of course, not only do they become friends, they become the deepest of friends, and their friendship lifts a whole town to joy and hope. That's an unusual coalition. Here's another one. Here's a group of hobbits. A couple of men, a wizard, a dwarf, an elf, some of these creatures are sworn enemies. All of them are deeply suspicious of each other, but a grave and serious task brings them together, a task of literally saving Middle-earth, and so they are drawn together for an epic adventure that results in lasting and profound friendships, the Fellowship of the Ring. This is an unusual coalition. And when you start looking for unusual coalitions, you begin to see them everywhere. You see them in history. Lincoln brings together highly unlikely allies, political enemies, in fact, to work together to pass the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. Nelson Mandela, upon being elected to the, uh, to, as president of South Africa, did the unthinkable and reached out to the South African rugby team, most of whom were Afrikaans, to build a reconciled and unified South Africa. This is documented in the film Invictus. You see unusual coalitions in sports, the 1947 Dodgers, who took the risk to hire the first African-American ball player named Jackie Robinson and overcoming enormous resistance and opposition, went on to win the National League pennant. The 1969 Knicks, who with this eclectic group of players, one was a Rhodes Scholar, Bill Bradley, a couple of other guys from the projects, they came together to win a national championship. And of course, who could forget the most epic, unusual coalition in all of sports history, Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. Two rivals who came together to join forces of the universe. Yes, of course. We see unusual coalitions in culture. When people like Bill Gates and Bono work together on the one campaign to address extreme poverty in the AIDS epidemic. We see unusual coalitions in politics, Bush and Clinton coming together to promote global development. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce and United Way came together to urge Congress to pass a budget deal to, during the federal shutdown. Uh, we saw it just this year with liberals like Richard Dermott and Tea Party leaders like Ted Cruz coming together to pass a prison reform bill. These are unusual coalitions. And unusual coalitions happen when people who would never normally work together and who would never even interact come together out of a commitment to overcome a common problem and work for a common purpose. When there is a crisis that is so great or a common purpose that is so galvanizing or so uniting that people are willing to push past the barriers that normally divide them and work together for a shared mission. That's an unusual coalition. Our topic this morning is unity. And I believe that unusual coalitions are one of the most powerful forms of unity in the world. Unity typically happens with people who are similar. People who have common backgrounds and common interests come together because they think or believe or approach the world in the same way. But honestly, unity like that is easy. Anybody can be unified with people who are just like you, who think like you, who act the same way, who approach life in the same way, share the same culture. 
But what is so powerful about unusual coalitions is that they are typically formed between people who have profound differences, people who are normally at odds. And when these kinds of people come together in unity, the unity is so much more powerful than it would be otherwise. One, because their common commitment speaks loudly to the importance of the cause. And second, because the opposing nature of their power is integrated and unified towards a shared end. This is the power of unusual coalitions. Now, the problem is, of course, is that unusual coalitions are rare. This is why they're so newsworthy and so remarkable when you see them because they so rarely occur. And they rarely happen, of course, because it is the nature of our humanity not to unite across difference but to divide by preference. So what is much more common among humanity, among our societies, is what we could call usual coalitions. <laughs> and usual coalitions just simply means people group together with those whom you would expect them to group together, people with common backgrounds and perspectives and common education and race and common interests and problems and common strengths and geographies and cultures. And I just want to say there's nothing wrong with people coming together who are like-minded or similar. That is much of how things get done in the world. But the problem occurs when these are the only kinds of coalitions that we ever form. When we only are ever willing to work with those who are like us and who think like us and who have the same backgrounds as we do, and when we only see those in our usual coalitions as those we have concern and responsibility for, this kind of mindset is, is, is ultimately destructive for communities because it perpetuates isolation and fragmentation, and it, it, it essentially creates networks of competing fiefdoms rather than a unified vision for a community. Friends, in some ways, you could see the problems of Metro Richmond as rooted in the problem of usual coalitions. I remember as I prepared to move to Richmond about 10 years ago, I actually picked up The Economist magazine and was astonished to find in that magazine an article about Richmond which said that this city has one of the highest rates of economic and jurisdictional segregation in the United States. Our region is one of profound ironies, that we played a key role in defending American freedoms and also a key role in defending slavery and institutionalized racism. And that even after slavery was abolished because of Jim Crow segregation and poll taxes and literacy tests and massive resistance, by 1970 there were deep patterns of residential and economic segregation and inequality that profoundly mark our region. And because Virginia is a Dillon state rule, Richmond is one of the only capital cities in the United States in which the city center is not a part of any of the adjoining jurisdictions, which has ensured that city residents and suburban residents remain profoundly divided and share little common vision for anything. And so here we are, Richmond friends, a network of fiefdoms. Whites with whites, blacks with blacks, Latinos with Latinos, immigrants with immigrants, rich with rich, poor with poor, suburbanites with suburbanites, urbanites with urbanites, educators only talk to educators, artists only with artists, business leaders only with business leaders, and our region is impoverished by our tribalism. Impoverished. True flourishing can only really happen when leaders and visionaries from many different sectors and many different perspectives and geographies come together even though they are seemingly unrelated and unconcerned for each other, come together for a vision of the common good. There is a project at the University of Virginia called the Thriving Cities Project. And it's a project that aims to assess or to ask the question, how can we tell if a city is thriving? And what's interesting is that the cornerstone, one of the key ideas of the project is, as you can guess, this is actually where I got the term from, unusual coalitions. This is what the director of the project says, Joshua Yates. He says, the concept of unusual coalitions is a key indicator of a thriving community, the degree to which unusual coalitions exist, and as essential ingredient of thriving communities, and not just in the aftermath of a crisis. It is of seminal importance that communities be actively cultivating networks of leaders across sectors in normal times so that when the crisis occurs, the foundation stones of trust and respect have already been laid. 
Josh Yates cites the example of Howard Fuller, who is the former superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools. And under the leadership of Fuller, this broad collection of people from multiple different sectors and backgrounds were all able to come together and they agreed together that the public school system in Milwaukee was failing. And the problem was so big and so clear to them that they were able to cross barriers and form this very unusual coalition between politicians and educators, between conservatives and liberals, and they designed and executed a strategy that resulted in Milwaukee becoming the birthplace of the school choice movement and remains the epicenter of that movement today. Unusual coalitions. This is the key to flourishing cities. Speaking personally, one of the richest experiences of my entire life has involved an unusual coalition. This is uh, Don Coleman. Don uh, grew up in one of the housing projects in East Richmond and then was later put into the foster system and grew up in North Churchill. Needless to say, um, although you might be surprised by this, we're pretty different. We have pretty different backgrounds, pretty different perspectives. But 10 years ago, God drew us together and through our friendship and common passion to see the power of the Christian message about grace overcome barriers of race and class. And out of this, God birthed a multiracial congregation called Eastern Fellowship. And these last 10 years of my life working with Don have been some of the most life-changing and impacting of my life. There are things that I have gained and learned and understood that I never could have ever accessed were it not for my friendship with Don. And I believe that there are things that have happened in Churchill and happened in Richmond that wouldn't have happened unless this band of diverse people had come together in an unusual coalition for the common good. I'm proud to be here today because I believe that the YMCA is one of many entities in our region that is working to build unusual coalitions. Let me just give you one example. As a result of the strategic plan, which is uh, conveniently enough sitting on your table, um, the Tuckahoe Y, listen to this, the Tuckahoe Y has spent the last 18 months reaching out and basically getting to know the demographic and ethnography of the surrounding community. You might not know this, that Bird Middle School which is located about a mile from the Y, has a 48% non-white population. It's Asian, Nepalese, Bhutanese, Black, and Latino. 40% of the kids at Bird are on free and reduced lunch. And what's so amazing, really almost shocking about this, is that just to the area south of the Tuckahoe Y has some of the most wealthy populations in the West End. And then just north of the Y, it is 180 degrees the opposite. And many of the families are refugee families who've recently arrived from literally a refugee camp in eastern Nepal. So what is the Y doing in response to this? They're building unusual coalitions. They're working with the schools. They're working with community leaders and churches to offer free and reduced programs like soccer and swim lessons and teen nights and programming so kids can get to know other kids, to socialize and be active. They're working with crossover ministries to provide a safe and welcoming place for families to come and learn to be healthy. And you might say, wait, 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 why, why is the Y doing this? I just thought that's where you went to work out, right? The swimming gym. <laughs> but no, the Y is strategically positioned to cultivate, to curate unusual coalitions that aim for the flourishing of our community. My friends, I'm, I'm just really here because I am just urging you, our city needs a fresh movement of unusual coalitions, people and groups coming together across jurisdictions, across political parties, across vocational sectors, across socioeconomic and cultural barriers, and working together for the flourishing of our communities, especially for the sake of the most vulnerable populations. This is ultimately what makes a city great, not just the amenities and restaurants and rivers and stadiums and businesses and schools, but at root, what makes a city great is the strength and quality of unusual, unpredictable, subversive coalitions of trusting relationships that serve the common good. This is immensely difficult. I will tell you from experience, our pride, our tribalism, my selfishness, our unwillingness to trust one another, our prejudices and suspicions, these things are so strong. They're constantly threatening to undermine our commitments to unity. And so I wanna ask you this morning just to do two simple things, two simple things in response to this. 
First, ask yourself, what unusual coalitions might you personally form? Maybe today. Who might you reach out to? For some of you, that might mean reaching out to a competing firm over a common purpose. For others, it might be inviting someone out to lunch of a different race. For others, it might be crossing the street and making friends with an intimidating neighbor. But who, where might you tear down a barrier and cross a boundary? What issue is disturbing enough to you that it would provoke you to collaborate with another person that you would normally never even consider? What unusual coalition might you form? Can you imagine? There's several hundred people in the room. Can you imagine if all of us did this in the next few weeks? The impact on our city would be profound. The second thing I'd ask you to do, thankfully we're here today at a prayer breakfast, is to pray. We are here at a prayer breakfast talking about this because we are acknowledging that the problems before us are so immense that our help ultimately must come from God alone. And in my own Judeo-Christian tradition, the God, this is really amazing actually, the God that we worship is a God of unusual coalitions. In the Hebrew scriptures, this God raises up misfits like little last born David or orphan girl Esther to take down some of the most powerful and seemingly unstoppable villains. And in the New Testament scriptures, the story goes that God comes down into the earth as a human is born to a poor teenage unwed mother and gathers a group of 12 uneducated fishermen and through these strange and wild coalitions turns the world upside down. So my friends, God... God himself is a God of unusual coalitions, and he loves to foster them in the world. So, coming back to where we started, what makes for a great story unusual coalitions? My friends, my brothers, my sisters, we are a part of writing the story of Richmond. So please, let's make it a good one. Thank you.